thank you for joining us for another episode of God, Law, and Liberty with David Fowler, president of the Family Action Council of Tennessee. Every week, we are putting culture, politics, and law on a collision course with the truth of God's Word. And now, here's David. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of God, Law, and Liberty. I'm delighted that you're with me, and today I will be following up on last week's podcast, in which I explained how I had once read the Bible like a Benthamite, referring, of course, to Jeremy Bentham and his positivistic view of law as simply commands of a sovereign to which penalties are attached and we're bound to obey. And I noted that this view of law is Gnostic. And I also gave an example from legislation being a championed by Christians regarding transgenderism and minors and, and showed how the leaders advocating for that legislation are doing so in a Gnostic fashion. And finally, I promised last week that I'd put this revelation of my once Gnostic view of the Bible and law in the context of the kinds of Christian views I've seen operating in the sphere of politics over the last, well, uh, almost uh, 30 years, um, which is, uh, of course, politics being the place where law and the ordering of society intersect. And in those two views, for the sake of simplicity, I styled them the neo-covenantal view, you may remember that, and the neo-baptistic view. And I did so because those who hold to the former view, um, neo-covenantal, are generally speaking in churches and denominations that more directly flow from the theological tradition of John Calvin and the later Puritans. And those who hold to the latter view, the neo-baptistic view, are generally speaking in those denominations who hold to believer's baptism, even, even though some of them may have a reformed soteriology. Now, of course, as I speak on this subject, I'm speaking generally, and I'm not speaking about any specific congregation or minister, but those I consider neo-covenanters still hold to the doctrines of sovereign grace and covenant theology that developed from it. But it seems to me that they have lost Calvin's cosmology and the eschatology brought forward from it and refined by Abraham Kuyper, namely that this new man in Christ that Christians are is to be a priest unto Christ, a priest unto God, I should say, bringing every square inch of the whole domain of human existence under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So while covenantal in the way they view soteriology and baptism, I call them neo-covenanters because they rarely want to talk publicly about law or politics, nor do the pastors of neo-covenanters or the neo-covenanter pastors, uh, they don't want to disciple their members in those subjects in any basic good citizenship, let alone even good stewardship of civil authority level. And to be honest, I'm not even sure how many could do so because no pastors in the Calvinism Kuyperian stream that I have ever met had a class in seminary on law as it pertains to society or civil government. And Calvin, those of you who may know of read his institutes, did have a small section in the institutes on the civil magistrate. But from what I can tell, even that is ignored in um seminaries today. So the neo-covenanter pastor and elders seem to leave discipleship in this area of law and society up to podcasters and perhaps a few other parachurch ministries. And I hope, as should have been clear from last week's podcast, that can be a very bad idea. But it seems to me their soteriology has degenerated to a piety that seems to have excluded anything public addressed to the larger society. And I'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes, but uh, I want to move on to the, the, the other group, the Baptistic group. And at one time, historically speaking, 
And unlike those in the um, Calvin Kuyperian covenantal stream, they wanted a stricter separation of church and state, almost at times taking on a two kingdom sort of approach, similar to that of Martin Luther. The church was a kingdom and it did its church things, and the ruler had a kingdom over the social order, and while he should always be Christian and rule Christianly, they were two kind of orders that um, didn't really interface with each other, so to speak. So the Anabaptist movement, which was away from the theology of covenant baptism, tended to be separatist in nature, following a desire to create a holy communion, a community, which is great and sound biblical tell us That's what we should be doing. That's the point of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. But it seems that they tried to do it through a sort of abstention from the world. And this abstention, this two-kingdom kind of theology worked fine until the Christian ethic in society was repudiated by rulers and the larger society, and society started falling apart. And in that falling apart, one of the results was that those holding to this uh, Baptistic view a separatist sort of view, this two-kingdom view, started getting squeezed by civil government in what they can do and can't do outside the church. So, as a result, it seems to me, those in the Baptistic Anabaptist kind of camp now want to engage more with civil government, and they want civil government to enact laws that reflect their ethics. So, so that kind of change in engagement is why I would call them neo-Baptists. They're they're sort of uh, different from perhaps you might say the Danbury Baptists that we're familiar with in connection with Jefferson and wanting a, a stricter separation of church and state. So here's my assessment of both of these groups. And again, it's based on what I've seen, and I'm speaking generally, but they are both Gnostic when it comes to law. And as was True of me, they, they don't even know it. So there's sort of my definition of the two groups and why I call them Neo. Um, but as I thought through what I would cover today, I realized I couldn't in 20 or 30 minutes expound on both of these two views and tie it into 1 Timothy, which I keep promising I will get to. And so today, I'm just going to give you my take on the neo Covenanters and what their form of Gnostic theology has produced. And I'll take up the Neo-Baptist next week. So uh, I uh, I hope you'll stay tuned for both of these, because I think when we break them down, if you'll hang in there with me, you'll have a better understanding why the form of Christian political engagement employed over the last 40 plus years beginning with like the Christian coalition, which wasn't not the Christian coalition, the moral majority, which wasn't even Christian, you know, on his face. But then following with Ralph Reed and his Christian coalition and the group he's now doing, Faith and Freedom or whatever, but uh, why none of that has done much of anything, if anything, to really restore righteousness or justice in society. And I think if you'll hang with me here, you'll see why I don't personally expect any better results from the view of law coming from those that are fed up with the neo-covenantal and neo-baptist camps and are rightly leaving them, uh, which is another camp, which I'll call the neo-theonomists. More about them in a future episode, so hang in there. I hope I I can uh, uh, kind of... uh, speak to to everybody who might listen to this podcast and be of help to them in thinking through their own positions. But for today, here's my take on the neo-covenanters. They are Gnostic, in my view, because they have divorced biblical theology, which entails law as Torah. Remember Burnside talking about that, as teaching about the nature of things and their purpose from really a metaphysics. Um, They've divorced it from any history other than that of the individual, resulting in pietism. 
More specifically, it seems to me, they've lost sight of their historic cosmology, specifically the dominion mandate, uh, which relates to the whole of the created order being developed for the glory of God. And, and so when you lose that historic cosmology and the purpose of creation, it's easy to lop off civil government and law as pertaining to society and from your view of the Great Commission. Genesis 128 seems, at least to me, among the neo-covenanters to be missing from the commission in Matthew 28. As if the new covenant has no historical relationship to the covenant with Adam prior to his transgression. It's of a completely different kind and nature. But this kind of break in history is what Gnosticism does. So the neo-covenanters, to me, seem to have lost sight of the history of their cosmology. And, of course, cosmology is the beginning of history, right? It's the telling you what, what, what is the nature of this place, its purpose, which goes to its history. But they've lost sight of this history of their cosmology that was fundamental to those who or should be fundamental, I guess you could say, to those who consider themselves following in the stream of Calvin and Kuiper. Uh, I'm going to share with you here in just a moment how Kuiper spoke of that history and the relationship between cosmology and politics, which, to be honest, I don't think many neo-covenanters are familiar with, or they wouldn't so strongly eschew anything political being discussed within their congregations, not not talking about Sunday morning in a worship service, but at any time. And and Kuiper pretty much damns them with these words. This is from his Lectures on Calvinism to the seminarians at Princeton Seminary in 1898. Listen to what he says. In order that the influence of Calvinism on our political development may be felt, It must be shown for what fundamental political conceptions Calvinism has opened the door and how these political conceptions sprang from its root principle. And right there, uh, we we find something that I think would be a revelation to many neo-covenantal pastors, that Calvinism influenced political development. Uh, The one subject they seem to studiously Avoid. I, I sat down with a young Presbyterian Orthodox pastor, and this kind of thing, as I read to him from from Kuiper's lectures, was like, "Wow, I I didn't know that." I mean, that's what I'm talking about. That's why they're neo covenantal, neo covenanters. And and then Kuiper lays out the bit of history that's essential to that influence. So so in that just that one sentence. He used political, 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 three times in one sentence. And then he lays out what that root principle is from which all that political influence sprang. And here's what he said. Quote, this dominating principle was not soteriologically justification by faith, but in the widest sense, cosmologically the sovereignty of the triune God over the whole cosmos in all its spheres and kingdoms, visible and invisible. Wow. There's there's the ascribing of the dominion mandate in Genesis 128 into the Great Commission, really, all flowing from their understanding of cosmology, which necessarily determines our understanding of history. So when we escape our cosmology that's in the Bible, we are Gnostic period. End of the discussion. So as a consequence of this historical and cosmological history or or of losing it, it it seems to me the neo-covenanters have also shrunken the communal aspects of the covenant. And, and, And what I mean by that is that the covenant and its law, its Torah, its teaching, it, it, it was, it was given for a new creation that was ushered in by the coronation of Christ to the right hand of the Father. 
And it seems to me the neo-covenanters understand the Torah, the teaching of God, is for a society of people who, who, in the words of Colossians 1.13, have been transferred to the kingdom of God, their son. But it also seems ahistorical for those who, who, who agree with that, but then don't want to talk about law in relation to ordering and handling disputes within a society of people who are presently part of that kingdom. And, and here's the problem. If they're not discipled in that, in those congregations, then how can that kingdom, composed of those congregations, and how can that kingdom's governing principles extend to every square inch of the whole domain of human existence? We're not being discipled in a way that we could extend those things outside the walls of our church because we won't even talk about them in our own church. So it seems to me, then, as a practical matter, the neo-covenanters put the kingdom of God and its extension off to some future eternal state. Um, so, so these denials by the neo-covenanters of their history and their history in relation to the nature of history itself, rooted first in cosmology, not soteriology, is why I call them new covenanters and call them Gnostic. Their view of law is Gnostic. It doesn't touch down into the present moment or connect in any way with the past development of law for the ordering of society. Um, the, the ones that I know, the leaders at least, have made Christianity a religion of strictly internal dimension, having no effect on society and therefore on history. So it seems to me the new Covenanters are ahistorical and therefore Gnostic. But, but I'm not the only one to notice this. Another is Harold Berman, the late professor of law at Harvard, the author of Law and Revolution, which some have called the standard point of departure for work in the field of Western legal history. I've referenced him many times on this podcast over the years, but today he's particularly pertinent with respect to the points I'm trying to make. And while he didn't use the term Gnostic, the theological term Gnostic, I think that's exactly what he describes and what he wrote. So I'm referencing here uh, just his introduction to the book, and in referencing Calvinism as a, quote, slightly later form of Protestantism, uh, of course, referring to the fact that Calvinism followed Luther, Berman wrote this. Calvinism had profound effects upon the development of Western law, especially in England and America. Well, he's saying exactly what, what uh, Kuyper said. But yet, despite that being their history, uh, the neo covenanters don't want to talk about any of that. That's a subject that's taboo. It's off limits. It's left to podcast by neo covenanters, um, neo Baptists, and Neo theonomist. And, and, uh, and, and so Berman then continues about these Calvinists. They emphasize two elements that were subordinated in Lutheranism. First, a belief in the duty of Christians generally, and not merely Christian rulers, to reform the world. Now, before I go to the second, let me interject here. When he refers to the duty to Christianize the larger society as being placed on the Christian ruler, he's referring to the two-kingdom view I mentioned earlier that often characterized the Baptist Antibaptists. Anabaptists, okay? So, so Calvinism specifically is saying that it was the duty of Christians generally, not just leave it up to the ruler of that other kingdom to reform the world. And in keeping with that, he says this, the second difference was a belief in the local congregation under its elected ministers and elders as the seat of truth, a fellowship of active believers higher than any political authority. The active Puritan congregations, and notice here his reference to congregations, not individuals, the active Puritan congregations bent 
on reforming the world were ready to defy the highest powers of church and of state. Of course, he's referring there to uh, the uh, Puritans, the Church of England, right? But, but prior to that, the Reformers, the Catholic Church. So they were willing to defy the highest powers of church and of state in asserting their faith, and they did so on grounds of individual conscience, also appealing to divine law, to the Mosaic law of the Old Testament, and to natural law concepts embodied in the medieval tradition. But what I find among the neo-covenanters is that this bent, particularly bent of a congregation, is totally missing. That, that idea that a congregation would be bent on, on seeing a reformation of the city or of the county or of a nation uh, seems to be wholly foreign to them, at least in, in the Presbyterian-related churches that I've been involved with for 10 or 15 years. So what Berman describes to me is what the neo-covenanters have abandoned with their emphasis on the individual and individual piety and the corresponding limitation on expanding the kingdom of God into the wilds and the wilderness of the public square. So, again, it seems to me the neo-covenanters have forgotten the history that God gave in the dominion mandate and the purpose for history. Or, or if, if it's not been forgotten, at least they no longer will publicly cast a vision for that among their congregations. That history is apparently irrelevant. And, and so as a consequence, it seems to me the new covenant has become, as a practical matter, a sharp break from a cosmological history and its goals laid out in the first two chapters of Genesis that Calvin and Kuiper were strong on, which is ironic to me, since covenanters fault the Baptistic for making a break in history and their flow in theology by having only believers' baptism. So, so in this way, it seems to me the new neo-covenanters are, are, are guilty of what they find to be a fault in the Baptistic group's non-covenantal view of history. It's the pot calling the kettle black, and they don't even realize it. So in sum, I don't think the neo-covenanters of our time could produce the society that, that developed in England that produced the common law or the society the colonists founded. And the evidence that I find for that conclusion is in the effects of neo-covenanters on society over the last hundred years or so. And our society has been no less a, a, a non-Christian wilderness, though technologically advanced, than were the societies that were Christianized in the Middle Ages and in England. So I find them impotent for the most part. And again, I'm, I'm not alone in my thinking. Berman wrote this as well. Here's what he said. Whoa, this is just not nice to have to think about. If you're a Christian, and particularly if you're of the covenantal Calvinistic Kuiper stream, he writes, Puritanism in England and America were the last great movements within the institutional church to influence the development of Western law in any fundamental sense. And he says that all changed after the formation of this nation um, in, in 1789. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's saying Puritanism, that Calvinistic theology, has been dormant and uninfluential for quite some time. Now, for those of you who may be neo-covenanters, who, who might protest Berman's, Berman's view of history and the development law of law in recent centuries, he, he adds this, um, which actually is very telling and, and somewhat damning as well. He adds, undoubtedly, 
prophetic Christianity. Now notice he refers there to prophetic Christianity. Continued to play an extremely important part in bringing about law reform. For example, in the abolition of slavery, in the protection of labor, and in the promotion of welfare legislation generally. Now, he's not referring there to the welfare programs as we think of them, but as the laws that were that were enacted, the positive laws to curb abuses that prevented human flourishing, like child labor laws and some of those things. Okay. But then he added this, which could well be said today of neo-covenanters, or at least the pastors that are neo-covenanters and their churches. He added, on the other side, organized religion, continued to support the status quo, whatever that happened to be. So you see here he draws a distinction between Christianity as having members who have a prophetic voice calling people in society to enact positive laws to, to curb wrongs and organized religion that was missing in action. And in my experience, trying over the last five years to enact the Marital Contract Recording Act, saying that the right to marry exists between a man and a woman, they don't have to get a license, they can go down and file an affidavit declaring to the government they're married, well, organized religion, under the grip of neo-covenantal and neo-baptistic pastors, they're still missing in action. You can't get a one of them to do anything publicly at least at any denominational level. You might get some individual pastors here and there. But the organized part of it is is missing in action. So Berman's right. And finally, Berman writes this, summing up the whole situation that he's just described there. And when when he says, you've been missing in action for quite some time, He says, but the significant factor in this regard, in the 19th century and even more in the 20th, it was the very gradual reduction of traditional religion to the level of a personal private matter without public influence on legal developments, while other belief systems, new secular religions, ideologies, and isms, he mentions Marxism, for example, were raised to the level of passionate faiths for which people collectively, dare I say a new kind of congregation, were willing not only to die, but also to live new lives. So as we lost our cosmology, our soteriology shrunk, and our eschatology got very small, and in rushed everything else. And it threw out the biblical cosmology on which law was developed, and in which our law and our nation was grounded. So here's what I'd sum up what Berman is saying. The the neo-covenant or pastors of the last hundred plus years, along with the neo-baptist pastors, and as a consequence of their leadership, their churches, lumping them all under, under the head of Protestantism that Berman talks about, They did usher in new laws to stop various bad things, but in the development of law that protected law from being converted to positivism, befitting a cosmos viewed as a machine and not as an organism, they utterly failed. They didn't keep what had been developed. They didn't pass it on. And the United States Supreme Court declared that older view of law and a biblical cosmology dead in 1938. And the neo-covenant pastors and naturally the congregations, as best I can tell, they don't know what happened to law in our country because law and anything outside their congregation or denomination is just of no interest or concern to them. And they don't realize, of course, their contribution to the rejection by the Supreme Court of law is grounded in the biblical cosmology. And, of course, for their lack of knowledge, uh, they have no interest in putting law back on a biblically sound cosmology. And that's what I described last week. Let's just get the law passed. Even if we're using the thinking of the world and the world's understanding of the cosmos and law, just stop the bad thing. So 
So they've unwittingly or by voluntary ignorance conformed their thinking to the world, and they need to be taught what, to be honest, I'm trying to cover here. And once taught, they need to repent and, and to divorce anything, in this case, law, from creation and the history of its development. That's what Gnostics do. Now, let me close quickly here with drawing attention to just how serious this is. Gnostics are, by definition, those who break the fifth commandment because that commandment rests on the premise that God created us as an historical people, people who develop his creation for his glory and pass on that development to those who will follow them for further development for God's glory. So the neo-covenanters broke faith with their own historical development and with history in general with respect to law and society when they fell victim to the break with all of history that's the French Revolution and that washed ashore in America about 100 years ago. And and what's worse, my friends, is Abraham Kuyper told the neo-covenanters, maybe they weren't neo-covenanters at the time, but that's what they became, the neo-covenanters at Princeton Seminary in 1898, that this would happen if they didn't pay attention. And this is how he began his last lecture among the stone lectures that he delivered that year. The chief purpose of my lecturing in this country was to eradicate the wrong idea that Calvinism represented an exclusively dogmatical and ecclesiastical movement. In other words, it was all about dogma and ecclesiology, the church. He expounds on that in his next sentence. Calvinism did not stop at church order. That's that's just an ecclesiology. He said it didn't exhaust its energy in a dogmatical construction, but it created a life and worldview such as was and still is able to fit itself to the needs of every stage of human development in every department of life. And this was his call to them in that lecture. It was, quote, not to copy the past as if Calvinism were a petrification, but to go back to the living root of the Calvinistic plant to clean and to water it, and so to cause it to bud and to blossom once more, now fully in accordance with our actual life in these modern times and with the demands of the times to come. He was calling them back to a history he saw them forgetting, and they did forget. And his prescription in 1898 is the very prescription that's needed for the neo-covenanters today that I am trying in, in a way not nearly as artfully or persuasively as Kuiper, but still trying to lay out and plead through the work of the Holy Spirit in listeners and in neo-covenanters out there. Go back to your history. Lay aside the Gnosticism that's engulfed you with respect to law and society and politics. I mean, what Kuiper wrote there about going back to the living root, that, that's keeping the fifth commandment kind of stuff. That's non-Gnostic stuff. And the seminarians didn't listen then and so far. I found the leaders among Calvinists and the broader group of neo covenanters among them still not listening. I'm praying they will. Oh, I plead with God that they would. And maybe if some today are listening or get a hold of this podcast, and after they finish getting mad at me, they might heed what's been said. And I'm happy to help teach them what they didn't get in seminary. And if I can, I hope they'll let me know. I'd be happy to do it. Well, next week, I'll take a look at the neo Baptists and the Gnostic theology they bring to law and politics, and that should be fun as well. So I hope you'll join me for the next episode of God, Law, and Liberty. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe too. God, Law, and Liberty is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts.
For more information, please visit us at www.facttennessee.org. That's F-A-C-Tennessee.org. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fact Tennessee.